Hello, and welcome to Building Codes for Building Decks, down the load path. Now from the decking, the load transfers to and through the joists. And everything with deck joists basically starts here in section R507.6, and then there's more details in these subsections about bearing and lateral restraint. And then we've got a few other tables and figures that are referenced out of this section. Now you can read all of that code on your own. It's not very much. So for this, I'm just going to present it to you along the load path, as we've been doing from decking and now to joists. Now the joists are receiving that vertical load from either the live or snow load on the deck, whichever is greater. And this is resisted by the saddles in the hangers or whatever the joists are bearing on. But of course, they've got to get the load over to those bearing points first. And anyone can probably guess that there's going to be some level of movement in this floor, some sag. And the code refers to that as deflection, and it only allows so much. And so deflection becomes the first criteria that limits the maximum allowable span of joists and beams. And we can see in the footnotes to the span table that an L over 360 deflection is what was used to calculate the maximum main spans in this table. And then you can see the conditions that were used for the cantilevered portions. Now, this makes for an easy example for a 10 foot span because we get 120 inches divided by 360 and we get a third of an inch, which is weird, a third of an inch. So using a tape measure, let's just round that down slightly and say, we're only allowed about 5 sixteenths worth of deflection on a 10 foot joist span. And any more deflection of that from an overspanned joist is our first failure, so to speak. So too much deflection is gonna be caused by too much bending stress in the actual fibers of this wood. When a joist is loaded, it's resisting the load by having compression created along the top edge and then tension created along the bottom edge. And the further apart those tension and compression edges, the stronger or stiffer the joist. So the taller the joist, the stiffer, as you'd probably assume. Now the easiest way to really see this tension is in a two-ply beam that has one ply incorrectly spliced at mid-span. And you can see the tension in the bottom opening up that splice, and you can see the compression in the top that's pinching it shut. And this is no different than this example of an incorrectly done roof beam, or this example of a bridge across a creek in the National Forest trails. And so this tension and compression is at its greatest at the center of span, and then it tapers down to zero at those bearing locations. And this is why as far back as the 1946 Uniform Building Code, and likely further back in time, notching has been prohibited in the middle portion of a span. And now the code's more specific that it's the middle third, no notches. And so this ties us back to course two and something we talked about with lateral bracing. I compared in that session this type of deck bracing to lead-in bracing on a wall except that you can't let it in on joists because you can't notch that middle third. Now here's the IRC figure about notching, and this is just for your reference, but I want you to recognize something really important about these figures and all my discussion about notching and drilling is that this is for simple spans only, spans that go from one bearing to another bearing with no cantilevers beyond. So outside of this middle, where the tension and compression reduces down to zero at the bearing ends, notches can be as deep as one-sixth the joist depth and as long as one-third the depth. So considering a two-by-six is the smallest joist that has a span provided in the code, you know that you're always going to be good with at least a, a seven-eighths inch deep notch by one and seven-eighths inch long. And then as you get to bigger joists, Obviously, the notch can go up from there. Now, since we're talking about deflection and that guy is talking about stresses, there's another stress to evaluate, and it's shear stress. And this is going to be really conceptual, okay? If we loaded the joist about like this, not the whole length, then those loads are going to be concentrated over to about this point of the wood, right? And so 
again, conceptually, there would have to be some other thing, some other piece of wood holding up those loads right here. And so this is occurring all the way across the length of the joist, and this represents the shear stress that's also evaluated. And this is what a shear stress failure is gonna look like. It's quite different than, than bending and deflection, which ultimately limits our span long before we start talking about shearing a joist in two. Now, opposite of bending stresses, the shear stresses are zero in the middle, and then they become greatest at their bearing points. However, those stresses are still so far below the bending limit, i.e. deflection limit, that the IRC actually allows notches up to one-fourth of the depth at these bearing locations. And this would allow a 2 by 10 joist to flush up to the top of a 2 by 8 while still on the same bearing location. Similarly, a 2 by 12 joist could flush up with the top of a 2 by 10. Now this graphic is mostly just here to depict all these different notching sizes because this isn't maybe a normal design condition that you're gonna deal with often. And there's some more details about the condition of notching in a hanger, and we're gonna talk about that in the next session. But one use for notching that can be very helpful is notching at the bottom of joists at bearing when you're building the joists into a cantilevered floor like we discussed in course two. Now in this photo, they left the deck surface flush to the floor inside, but had they done a notch at this bearing point, it could have allowed them to lower those deck joists down, have more room for flashing, and have a step outside the door, which is ideal in regions with snow. Now this is a similar example, but what they did here was used larger joists for the deck than what were used for the house, and they were able to notch out the bottom of the deck joists so that they can still bear on the same bearing surface as the floor joists of the house. And hey, that looks to me like about a maximum one-fourth of the depth. Now drilling holes is something else that the code provides for, and we'll just briefly look at it in this figure here. The diameter of the hole can be up to one-third the depth of the joist, and that's anywhere along its length, including that middle third. However, it can't be so big that it's closer than two inches to the top or bottom edge. So we just talked about those edges are where we want the tension and compression to be continuous. All right, now I do feel like I have to bring this up because it's normal if we learn something new, we're excited to put it into practice. But how often do you notch joists or see notch joist? Probably not incredibly often. But what I do see long before the deck loading causes a deflection of the joist is that it's really good practice and common practice to install joists with their crowns all facing up. Lumber's not straight, and that's gonna limit how wavy the deck surface is. However, high-end builders that wanna have a really nice finished project will often shave down an excessively crowned joist for a flatter deck and happier clients. And this is the same way that studs sometimes get shaved down before drywall. And quite frankly, this does not meet any of these rules for notching, right? I guess it would technically be like a notch, but it would certainly be more than the, a third of the depth in length. That said, I'm not terribly concerned about shaving down the tops of joists, and that's because this is all related to deflection, and we've still got some more to talk about. Now, I would make sure that if you notch joists and if you were to shave the top down, that you do field treat your treated wood, like we talked about in course one. All right, but if you are worried that shaving is going to cause more deflection and go beyond the maximum deflection limit, perhaps maybe the joists are already at their maximum span and so a little shaving would exceed the allowable deflection. Well, in that case, let's look at maybe some other ways we can resist deflection. Now, deck builders will understand this one. If you were to just go walking across these joists, they're going to wobble under your feet. And even if you had perfect balance standing on one and loading it perfectly straight down, perfectly still, the joists do not like this tension and compression. And so they roll to the side to relieve themselves of that stress. And this is why those same high-end builders I talked about will often bridge block the center span of their joists, the center of their joist spans. 
because this forces those joists to stand upright and take that stress, which is going to have them perform their job better. And it also connects all the joists together to act a little more together. And this incredibly stiffens the deck. And hey, maybe this is a reasonable way to make up for a little deflection from possibly a little planing. Sensible solutions. All right, but the real reason I wanted to talk about these stresses and the rolling over of the joists is to start to get us set up for the discussion on lateral restraint. Now, the code doesn't require that, bl that bridge blocking in middle span for any standard. Well, that was just the beginning of session two, joists, in the on-demand course, Building Codes for Building Decks, Down the Load Path. You can take the full on-demand course at buildingcodecollege.com. Every on-demand course is broken into multiple sessions, and each session includes an instructional video. Also included are referenced code sections for every code talked about in that session video. Most sessions include a self-study with some bonus educational material, and you complete all sessions by taking the practice quiz. Then you're ready to move on to the next session of the course. If you'd like to take that on-demand course or any other courses at buildingcodecollege.com, I welcome you to use this coupon code for 10% off. Regardless, my name is Glenn Mathewson, and thanks for learning with me today. This clip was provided to you by buildingcodecollege.com, where we go beyond the words.